The consumer camera is dead. It's terrible, devastating news for the entire industry. It's causing Canon and Nikon and the other camera companies to scramble to move into some other sort of non-camera related businesses. It's causing camera stores to simply shut down. It's a huge deal. Let's look at the history of the consumer camera and talk about the future of cameras in general and, and maybe what camera companies can do to stay relevant. Back in like 1900, in the early 1900s, the, these Browning cameras, the Kodak cameras were, were huge. And this was really one of the first consumer cameras. It was easy to use. It was inexpensive. You could pick it up and you could take pictures. And this is what Ansel Adams started with. And that's important because consumer cameras feed into the enthusiast and eventually into the professional market because that's how people fall in love with photography is the consumer camera. In the 70s, one of my favorite cameras ever, the Canon AE-1 became huge because the AE stood for auto exposure and it was inexpensive and it looked nice and it felt good in the hands and it could take good pictures. And maybe your dad had that, maybe you had it. And you would take pictures with that 35 millimeter film and you drop it off at the pharmacy and then in a couple of days, you'd go and you'd give your last name and you'd pick it up and you'd get like the set of four by sixes. Maybe you, you sprung the extra money to get two of them. So you could give one set to some friends or something and you put them in a photo album. And that's how people shared pictures. You'd bore the crap out of your family with pictures of your vacations. You'd make people stand in front of landmarks, but that was the consumer market. And that's how we shared what was going on in our lives. And this was huge. And not just in 1976, but straight from 1900, right up until just a couple of years ago, this was a major part of every family's lives. Everybody had some type of camera. Maybe it was the point and shoot camera with the little flash cube on top. It's been around forever. Camera companies have built up huge businesses on it and it's gone now. In the late nineties, consumer cameras made that transition to digital for the most part, and for some really good reasons, because this is, by the way, the Sony Mavica. I like that it's a, you could put a CD in it and record pictures directly to a CD. One of my friends had these, but everybody pretty much got one of these digital consumer cameras because of, you know, Match.com, 1997. You, if you were dating and you wanted to use online dating, you had to put a picture of yourself up, which meant you had to have some kind of digital camera, which meant you sprung for a Canon PowerShot or a, a Nikon, whatever they call them. Uh, 2005, MySpace became huge. You needed a picture of yourself. You needed it digitally. Your old film disposable camera wasn't going to give that to you. People were springing for digital cameras left and right. They didn't want to learn photography. They were just consumers. They just wanted pictures. It was a huge business. And then in 2007, Apple released the first iPhone and it had a camera and that camera sucked. It was two megapixels and you couldn't do much with it at all. <laughs> uh, technically it had a camera, but at the time, if you remember, you couldn't even upload your pictures to MySpace directly from there because it didn't let you upload files from the browser. It was like some security thing or something. So the iPhone didn't immediately have a big impact, but the successors to the iPhone sure had a huge impact. A year later in 2008, you can look at camera sales and the driving forces of people moving their content online, sharing images online meant everybody was buying digital cameras. And this is from CIPA. They just track camera sales. So you can see going back to 1999, these are digital cameras. The blue line is fixed lens cameras, basically what we'd call point and shoot cameras. The red line here or the orange line is interchangeable lens cameras, everything from DSLRs to mirrorless cameras at this time it was mostly DSLRs. They're both going straight up, right? <laughs> and if you've ever been in business meetings, strategy meetings, a bunch of business people gather around a big oak table and they point to charts like this and they say, uh, we project it's going to go up like a hockey stick forever indefinitely. So let's invest tons of money because we don't want to be left out. That's my business guy voice. And that's what everybody did. They looked at this chart at 2000. Who could blame them? It looks great. The camera industry is taking off. If we don't pour a bunch of money in, we're basically losing out big time. So we saw a lot of manufacturers jump in on this. They wanted to bring that huge consumer camera market a little bit 
upstream, get them a little more advanced. The DSLRs were big and clunky at the time, so mirrorless cameras came around. Really the first important one was the Micro Four Thirds cameras, the Panasonic and Olympus cameras, and the, the G1 in 2008, and all of the successors have been huge, and they continue to be huge. Um, 2010, Samsung, a big electronics maker, jumped in there. Samsung also making smartphones and such. Uh, Sony, also making smartphones and such, but they didn't want to be left out. They came up with their E-mount mirrorless cameras. And in 2010, Instagram launches. This is important because right now, Instagram is the biggest photography community in the world. At the time, before this, it was like Flickr. And you know the workflow for Flickr. You take pictures on your digital camera and you take out the memory card and you put the memory card in your computer and you go through them in Lightroom or whatever software came with your phone, with your camera, and then you upload your favorite pictures to Flickr. And it's this kind of big process. And Instagram presented a very different workflow. You picked up your smartphone and you took a picture. And what if you wanted to take a picture with your digital camera and put it on Instagram? Well, you really couldn't because that's what, that wasn't what Instagram was about. In fact, you can't go to your computer and upload a picture to Instagram. Not even today. That's not allowed. You can sneak pictures through something like Lightroom Mobile, or you can email a picture to your smartphone and post it. But Instagram really doesn't want people using real cameras. And this is noteworthy. This is an app, a photography app, that's shutting out cameras in favor of smartphones. That's a big deal. And this was a turning point in the history of the consumer camera. But looking back at that 2008 chart, things were going great and it takes companies a couple of years sometimes to do the R&D and to get the funding and to actually make a camera camera ready. So even by 2011, even though things have started to turn, camera companies are still kind of hedging their bets and moving into the mirrorless market. We saw the Nikon One come out. They're calling these bridge cameras bridging the gap between big DSLRs and these cheap consumer cameras that were a huge hit, providing more capabilities, more flexibility was with interchangeable lenses. Fuji finally jumps in in 2012, makes some excellent mirrorless cameras. Canon even starts making the EOS M mirrorless cameras. Everybody's joining the game because they all think it's going to keep getting better and better and better. Also in 2012, Snapchat launches. Snapchat huge video and photo sharing app right now you can't even there's no way to get your pictures from your phone from your camera into snapchat it's smartphone only you can't do anything from a computer they've completely shut out computer users and camera users you have to do everything with your phone and that's pretty huge and it's also huge because snapchat is amazing. It's actually fascinating. If you don't use Snapchat, definitely get on there. I'm on Snapchat. You can uh, give me a dog face and you can do all sorts of fun things and you can stream it instantly to all of your friends, video or stills. That's all stuff you can't do with a camera. Even if they would let you take pictures with cameras, you couldn't do that stuff with cameras. Smartphones are just more sophisticated because they have this infrastructure where anybody can make an app and that and those people can make money from those apps. And that encouraged clever developers like the people behind Snapchat to make industry changing tools, whether for work or for fun. So fast forward a few years to 2016 and where are we with regular cameras? We're here. We're with the memory card reader and the SD card and you plug it in your USB port and you copy your pictures into some software and then you go through them and then you upload them. Whereas in the smartphone world, you go like this, you just tap, share. And there it is. So for a lot of professionals, we like this process. We're comfortable with this and we're going to, nobody's going to take this away. This is going to keep happening. I promise the camera industry doesn't move very quickly at all. This is going to stay put. And if you like that, you're in luck, but there's a disconnect because the younger generation has now learned photography using tools like Instagram and Snapchat. And this process seems ponderous. It's been almost a decade now since the iPhone was released. The iPhone providing like instant, always on connections for your, the pictures that you take with the built-in phone. And this is what camera manufacturers are still giving us, SD cards and memory card readers. Let's look at what happened to camera sales after that big point in 2008. 
they they plummeted. Remember this blue line is consumer cameras just completely dropped off. Why? Well, the iPhone in 2007, Instagram 2010, Snapchat, and so many uh, hundred other apps that made the smartphone so much more useful than those stupid consumer cameras with their memory cards and all of that. Instant communication, fun apps, and an app infrastructure motivated by people spending money. Um, it's been amazing. But, but also notice the orange line here didn't go down. This is the interchangeable lens cameras. These are the cameras not for consumers necessarily, but for enthusiasts and professionals. And that didn't drop off. Really, because photographs have only become more and more important to our world. It's the camera that's become less important, but photography has become increasingly important. Only recently have uh, the interchangeable lens cameras started to drop off, and I think it's it's all it's still just part of this uh, trend for consumer cameras because some consumers were using like the Nikon One and the EOS M cameras, these sorts of bridge cameras, and those are the cameras that are falling out. The pro high-end cameras that we all get excited about, those are still doing great. And in fact, I think we'll see camera companies put more and more of their energy into those cameras. This has had a huge impact on all camera manufacturers, all camera stores, everybody really involved in the camera industry. This is just a chart of Canon stock versus, I think, the Dow Jones. And, and the green line here is the Dow Jones and the, the blue line at the bottom is Canon stock. And you can see just a massive gap. The Dow is up 58% and Canon seems to be down 45%. <laughs> uh, it's been rough. And if you read their financial reports, which I have, Canon, Nikon, they're all saying, look at our copiers. <laughs> Look, we're making metal, medical equipment now. We're not just a camera company. Don't run and jump. Don't run away yet. We can do more than just cameras. Ah, so Samsung, dead. Nikon 1 series seems to be dead. Canon EOS M seems to be dead. These camera manufacturers are just cutting their losses. They came up with this plan to make these cameras, and then the industry changed, and it just took them a while to adapt because companies are are not little sports cars that turn on a dime they're huge boats that just you crank the wheel and then you wait 20 minutes and eventually they start to gradually turn so it took quite a few years after that chart turned down for the companies to realize okay this is this is dead but people are still excited about cameras consumers are still excited about cameras my 12 year old kid is excited about cameras they're just the cameras that apple's making this is happening september 7th and we think it's the iphone 7 and hmm, what do you think this announcement means? It's showing bokeh, right? This is how Apple is advertising an upcoming iPhone, and it's going to have a new camera in it that's going to give you some background blur. That's a feature that's only really been available from proper cameras up until now. People are excited about cameras. They're just not excited about Canon, Nikon, Fuji, Pentax, etc. They're excited about Samsung. Apple, Motorola, and Sony smartphones, that kind of thing, because that's where the excitement is. Not because they're better at being cameras, but because they're better at communicating and sharing because they're more sophisticated, they're faster. The camera companies just missed this change. And these new competitors came out of nowhere. <laughs> it's like when uh, the uh, trucking industry overtook trains for transportation. It's like when cars came along and killed off most saddle makers because suddenly people didn't need as many horses. It's like when Apple basically took over Nokia. You know why Nokia didn't make that uh, turn that Apple made when they started making the iPhone? Because they were more of a hardware company than a software company. And that's saying, that holds true for the camera manufacturers too. They're hardware company companies and they keep making hardware. The consumer camera industry is gone. Canon, Nikon, Fuji, they're not going to win them back. It's too far gone. <laughs> if they had changed direction a little earlier, a decade ago, I think they might have had a chance, but it's it's too late now. We're not going to give people to get people to give up their smartphones for consumer cameras, just in my opinion. But there are still the enthusiasts. The pros are okay. We're always going to be on big cameras. The enthusiasts in the middle are the people who really love photography, who might not be satisfied with their current smartphone camera, 
and they're not necessarily willing to wait for the next generation of smartphone camera to come out. They know they can get better results with a reel and camera. The enthusiasts are the ones who love photography the most. And we can see Nikon in particular trying to kind of bridge this gap between those who are learning photography on the smartphone and their real camera. Snapbridge is the first real innovation I've seen in a long, long time, uh, besides, you know, adding a touchscreen finally. I finally, in 2016, I finally have a touchscreen on my pro camera. It just took Canon uh, nine years after the release of the iPhone to realize a touchscreen was a good idea, of course. Snapbridge, the way it works, it uses Bluetooth communications to automatically send pictures you take with your Nikon camera over to your, right now, only your Android phone. So I can take a picture with my camera, pull out my phone, open up Instagram, and there's the picture I just took. It's pretty amazing. It doesn't work great. It's a little flaky. I really hope Nikon can be a good software company and release some updates, make it reliable, and finally get that iOS. And of course, it needs to run on Apple devices too. Get that iOS app out there. Uh, Nikon doing some innovation, trying to stay ahead of the, well, not, they're already behind the curve, but they're trying to catch up at least. Um, Let's talk about what else camera companies can do to move these people who are learning photography on their smartphones into proper cameras. Instagram is what the Brownie camera was in 1900. The next Ansel Adams right now is using Snapchat and Instagram, and he or she is going to be producing amazing work, but that's where they are. And we need to find that talent, those people who will be enthusiasts, and we need to make the transition easier for them. Because right now, if you, if you see somebody who learned photography on Instagram, like my daughter, if you see her pick up a camera, the first thing they do is they try to touch the back, the screen, and usually that doesn't do anything. And if they do manage to open up the menus, they're absolutely baffled by the user interface because they've learned on proper, elegant user interfaces like that provided by Apple's iOS. We have to ditch the current... <laughs> tab and menu-based user interface, which really hasn't changed much in the last decade, and put in a proper touch UI. Of course, that requires a touch screen. <laughs> Scrap the user interface completely. We need to provide USB charging, and that seems like a small thing, but everybody nowadays is always burning through their smartphone batteries, and we carry around USB chargers. We have chargers in the car and next to your bed, and you know what happened when my daughter, I, I I loaned her an EM5 Mark II, the most friendly camera we happened to have when we took a vacation. She ran out of batteries and she just plugged it in. She found the USB port and she plugged it in. <laughs> and I was like, that's, that's actually not going to work. I know this seems crazy. That's how you charge everything nowadays. But no, it seems absurd to a 12-year-old that you have to carry a separate battery charger and take your battery out and put it in and find a plug on the wall and wait for it. And mean, meantime, you can't use it at all because you took the battery out. That's ridiculous. We need to start taking smartphone technology. Samsung, Sony, they can do this. Everybody else needs to learn it. We have to get rid of the memory cards. This is archaic. Can you imagine telling a 12 year old that they're used to just taking a picture with their phone and putting it on Instagram, telling them, okay, now uh, go back to your computer, take the memory card out, put it into the slot here, then uh, go open an app, file, import. No, that's absurd. We have to eliminate that whole process. It needs to be seamless. And there are a couple of ways we can do this. Unfortunately, the current technology is, is really limiting. Nikon SnapBridge uses Bluetooth, but Bluetooth is very, very slow. And that means either you send over a low megapixel file or you wait like 10 minutes for your full picture to be transferred over. That's ridiculous. We need a new, faster version of Bluetooth. And that's going to be difficult because I don't know who else wants that besides camera manufacturers, and they have to get the cooperation of companies like Apple and Samsung and Google and Motorola to actually implement that. Good luck. <laughs> because you know what? Smartphone manufacturers aren't real keen on cooperating with camera manufacturers, and that might be why that, that there is no good link between the DSLR and a smartphone. Another option would be creating cameras that have a constant connection to the cloud. If your camera could upload pictures directly into Lightroom Mobile, then you could just pop up Lightroom Mobile on your phone and have all your pictures there, or it could be Instagram or whatever. Either way, we have to find a way to cut out that ridiculous memory card 
process. If we want to get the next generation into photography, um, wireless firmware updates, of course, uh, first we need more firmware updates. We need companies to start treating cameras more like they, they do smartphones because if you have an iPhone that's a couple of years old, Apple is still giving out updates. If you have a camera that's a couple of years old, they're probably not giving you any updates. And if they do, guess what? You're breaking out the memory card reader, you're breaking out the memory card, you're copying a bin file into the root directory, you're putting it in, you're installing it. That's a nerdy thing to do. A 12 year old can't do that. An 18 year old who doesn't know how to use computers can't do it. We have to be able to get rid of the computer entirely. A lot of these cameras have wireless connections. Just please, a developer, just tell it to connect to your website and download the file automatically. Make a little nice little notification. Also push out constant updates that improve the cameras, even older cameras, instead of kind of having this thing where, oh, if you want a new version of bracketing, you have to buy a whole new camera body. That's absurd. We also need open apps. You know what made the 5D Mark II such a success for video making? It was Magic Lantern. Magic Lantern was this, somebody figured out how to hack into the 5D Mark II software and put in their own operating system. And once they did that, they were able to code it to make the camera do all these things it couldn't do, like show zebras and focus peaking and even record like limited amounts of 4K high resolution video. These are all things that the hardware is capable of doing and only the software didn't know how to do it. And that camera became a huge success. And Canon has not cooperated with Magic Lantern at all. They don't want third party apps in their cameras operating systems. And I know you're gonna say it's not stable and maybe it wouldn't be, but that's a challenge. That's something they have to work out because guess what? Phones are pretty stable. Your computer is pretty stable nowadays and they run lots of different apps. You can build walled gardens inside an operating system that allow for the flexibility and power that we need. I don't want Sony's effort at putting apps on phones. Cause if you have a Sony <laughs> camera, you know that you can install an app from like Sony Entertainment Network and it's awful. It's just an excuse to charge you like 10 bucks to get a proper uh, time-lapse tool on the, on the camera. It's super clumsy and slow. Now I want third-party apps. I want developers to be able to create things to extend the capabilities of their cameras. This will open up a whole new world. I cannot believe that not a single camera manufacturer has decided to adopt this model. Well, Samsung actually went down that direction, but they're gone. Direct app connections. You know who is innovating? There's a picture of a DJI Phantom here. DJI, they let external apps run on their cameras. So if you're worried about stability, well, they're willing to put it on their cameras that fly around in the sky and might crash into people's houses and stuff. Your camera, at least it's not gonna fly over and hit somebody in the face, right? Um, but you can run third-party apps on these flying cameras and the effects are amazing. Look up my drone deploy video where I, use a drone and a third party app that was free to create a 3D model of the world, the neighborhood, the house, whatever. It's incredible the things you can do when you let developers create tools and give them financial motivation, let them make a few bucks off of it. It'll stop cameras from becoming old and archaic. The number one advice I have for camera manufacturers is stop acting like a hardware company. A hardware company releases a new piece of hardware every three to four years. And then they walk away from it. Maybe they release a minor update if there's a serious problem. But generally, if you want a new feature, you wait until the next gen comes out in three to four years. They need to start acting like software companies. They need to make, uh, it requires the company to be structured differently. Management has to be, well, probably different people. They'll probably have to get executives and managers from software companies. They'll need to change their QA processes, their release processes. It would be a big deal to make that shift from being a hardware company to a software company, but it could be life and death for these companies. Sure, they'll be able to carve out some small niche making high-end enthusiast cameras and pro cameras. That market's not gonna go away. There's always gonna be big Canon glass at the Olympics, but the consumer market is disappearing, is disappeared, and the enthusiast market is going to continue to shrink unless you guys make this change. It's dire times for these companies. I hope 
you can do it. <laughs> and I hope this helps. I, I'd like to toss it out there and collectively we can come together and pitch our ideas for what the next generation wants from their cameras. Now I know there's a bunch of old codgers out there saying, I like my memory cards. I don't want a touch screen and I don't even want video on my camera. That's fine. You will always have cameras. There were people out there, there were people out there still shooting film. They didn't make that leap. You don't have to make the leap. Nobody's pushing you along. I'm asking people who are 12 year old, 12 year olds now, 18 year olds now who are growing up learning photography on the new consumer cameras, what will get them to take photography to the next level? And what kind of gear would you make that they'll feel comfortable with that they'll be able to realistically pick up and use and get the same satisfaction of social networking and sharing? I have books and stuff. Check out my photography book, Lightroom, post-processing, Photoshop, a whole book on gear, sdp.io slash store, or search for my name, Tony Northup at Amazon. Of course, subscribe for free videos. Share, like, thank you, bye.